everyone, welcome back as we do our last sweep of ancient Greek and a little bit of Roman philosophy. Now this is going to be a relatively short video and that's because I don't want to set you up too well. Um, part of learning to do philosophy is not just learning about what people believed or learning what people said. A very important part of philosophy, a primary part of philosophy, is in learning how to engage with thought. How to read somewhat abstract material, how to relate that to your current understanding, how to kind of figure out where you want to go with your understanding, you know, what needs to change, um, what sparks of goodness, of truth, of beauty do you find in the thought of others, and how can you bring that into your own mind, and then also how do you guard your mind against thoughts that are potentially dangerous, things that are likely to lead you in a bad direction. And so, my goal in this video is just to give you some very broad orientations, some basic ideas of what you're going to be reading, and then you'll be working through the text and you know, maybe they'll click right away and you'll understand exactly what's happening, or maybe you'll struggle through with some partial understandings that you uh, are just starting to piece together, and that's okay too. That is an important part of doing philosophy. Uh, and then when we meet again at the beginning of week three, that's when we will get into some of these details as we discuss these texts together. First, I want to talk about a very big level difference between ancient philosophy and modern or postmodern philosophy, the kind of philosophy that you're used to, the kind of philosophy that we all grew up in in our current age. And it might be easier to actually start with the postmodern philosophy that we're all kind of used to. Um, odds are that you've heard a number of times throughout your life that the most important thing you can do is to speak your truth, to live your truth, to make your voice heard. And that's because in the postmodern era of philosophy that we currently live in, there's this prevailing idea that there really is no such thing as truth. There is no capital R reality. There is no real beauty, no real goodness. Everything is sort of determined by the individual. It all comes down to a opinions, it all comes down to preference, but there really is no capital T truth. There's nothing that we ought to believe, there's nothing that we ought to conform our lives to, there's no one way that we ought to live. These are ideas that you have heard your entire life through media, from politicians, probably from teachers, that's just kind of the world that we live in. And so you might take that for granted. However, I think it's worth noting that if you look at the majority of recorded history of human thought, um, these were not beliefs that were very popular. In fact, if you go to the pre-modern era, and so go to the ancient era, the classical, the, the medievals, they overwhelmingly are convinced that there actually is something like the good, right? We saw that in Plato's writings. There is something like the good. There is a way that we ought to live. Now, maybe there's a, a range of ways we ought to live, but nonetheless, we should all be moving toward uh, what it means to be human, right? We should be using reason and virtue in order to become better people. And that, of course, means that there is such a thing as a better and a worse person. And that, and that might not be something that we really want to hear. Maybe it's not something we're comfortable hearing, right? In, in our era where uh, we raise up tolerance as the chief virtue. But uh, I want you to recognize that you might already have more in common with these pre-modern ways of thinking than you actually recognize. I mean, for example, I mean, if, you know, we use the extreme ethical scenario, we, we bring up Hitler, we bring up the Holocaust. Um, odds are all of you, or at least m most of you, I, I hope all of you, are going to look at genocide and say, that's not just something I don't like, but that's something that's actually wrong. Maybe even it's something that is evil. Well, that then begs the question. When I say that that's wrong, well, why is that wrong? Wrong, wrong by what standard? Well, maybe then you'll say um, that human life is intrinsically valuable. Okay, and I would agree with that, but the question is, how do you know that? What makes somebody wrong when they devalue human life? What makes murder wrong? What makes stealing wrong? What makes lying wrong, at least in most circumstances? Right? These are things that we all recognize are wrong, but the question is, why? What is this moral law that we're all appealing to at the same time that we are inclined to say that there is no moral law and you can just live however you want to? And, and so maybe, just maybe, the things that we say we believe aren't actually what we believe. And so maybe as we read the pre-moderns, you'll actually find people who are 
far closer to your understanding than maybe even some of the mantras that you've heard for your entire life. And, and my goal in this course is not to indoctrinate you in any particular philosophy, but just to get you thinking, get you asking these questions, to help you get a broad level understanding of the history of thought, recognizing that the things that are popular in this era are not things that have always been popular. And at the same time, I'm not trying to convince you that everything in the ancient world is true and necessarily better than where we are today. People in previous eras certainly made mistakes and we should be able to recognize and point out those mistakes. However, they made different mistakes than we did. So too, it's very likely that we are also making mistakes that they didn't make. And so just as two heads are better than one, I firmly believe in the importance of bringing people from other eras into conversation with where we are today. And that way we become more aware of our blind spots and we're able to think more critically, more reasonably, and maybe even discover something far more true, good, and beautiful than we are equipped to do with the tools that are available in our current era. Okay, so now I just want to very briefly touch on um, who you'll be reading about this week. Now, first we have Aristotle, um, one of the most important figures in the history of Western thought, one of the most important figures really in world history. Now, Aristotle was a direct student of Plato, as well as a tutor for Alexander the Great. And so again, he is a very important part in world history and in the history of ideas. Now, we'll talk about Aristotle in some other context during the course, uh, but for this week, you're going to be reading his Nicomachean Ethics, which is uh, his book on ethics, his book on how we ought to be living. And he believes that uh, a thing's good can be reasoned to by understanding kind of what makes a thing that thing. So what is it that makes humans human? And he says that what quintessentially makes us human, that makes us distinct from other creatures, from other things in this world, what makes us distinct is the fact that we are able to use reason. And so for that reason, Aristotle defined human as the rational animal. We are animals in that um, you know, we have bodies that have animalistic cravings, desires, needs. Right? We all have appetites for food and drink. We have a, a sexual drive. Uh, we have a desire to propagate the species. We desire power and, and all these different things that animals tend to desire. We have those desires as well. But what makes us different is that we also have reason. And that means is that we're able to think more abstractly. We can consider different scenarios. We can reflect on our desires and we can think about different courses we might take and then figure out which of those courses is worth taking. And so that really gets to kind of what he means by reason. We're able to think abstractly about what could be and then determine what should be. And maybe you can argue that, you know, animals seem to do this on, on some level, but it certainly is not the same kind of thing that we engage in as humans. And so it is our reason, our ability to think abstractly about what could be and what should be that separates us and sets us apart. And so for Aristotle, the good of a rational animal is to be just that, to be rational, to be led by reason, not led by animalistic impulse, not led by our lust for power, our lust for food, our lust for sex. Whenever we make these our leading drives, we're behaving like animals. We are descending downward into our bestial nature instead of rising up to the domain of reason, of thought, and of virtue. And Aristotle believes that as we fulfill our form, as we fulfill our ideal, the more that we live according to reason, the more that we live according to virtue, the more that we do the right thing, the more that we think the right thing. He says that that's when we'll experience the greatest fulfillment, the greatest joy, what he calls eudaimonia, which gets translated into English usually as something like happiness or the happy life. But we should be careful there because we use happy very tritely today, where happy is just sort of whatever, whatever makes you feel good. Um, Aristotle's using it in a very specific sense of not just whatever makes you feel good, but whatever, but that which actually makes you good and gives you a sense of fulfillment. If you just want to feel good, then you can give yourself over to, you know, drugs and food and drink and kind of whatever else is just going to give you that temporary high. But that's not at all what Aristotle is interested in. When he talks about happiness, what he means is the good life, the life that you ought to live, the life that's going to lead to your flourishing. And so we have this union here where living as you're supposed to is not a matter of just begrudgingly doing the right thing, but it's a matter of 
uh, cultivating virtues, cultivating mindsets that are actually going to lead to you flourishing, that are actually going to lead to you uh, having the best experience of life you could possibly live. I think that there's a lot of truth here. I think there's a lot of wisdom here that the more that you cultivate your affections, the more that you cultivate your mind so that you're thinking the right things and feeling the right things and doing the right things, well, the, the more that you're going to enjoy thinking the right things and doing the right things and feeling the right things. And so uh, that is Aristotle. You'll get more of the specifics on that as you do the reading. And then when we talk about the reading in the next live session. Now, another perspective we're going to look at is that of Epicurus. Now, Epicurus goes a very different direction. I mean, he's also going to pursue happiness, but he means something very different than that. And that's because Epicurus... Um, functionally is something like an atheist. Uh, you know, he believes that if the gods exist, well, they don't really matter. Um, when you die, you die. And so all you have is this life. He very much lives on the material here and now plane. So Epicurus was very important in the school of thought known as hedonism. Now, if you go to classical hedonism, this means something very different than we tend to get today, right? We think of hedonism as eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Party it up, do whatever makes you feel good in the moment, stereotypical uh, college scene. But this is actually not what he's propagating. The hedonism that Epicurus propagates is really dominated by reason. Epicurus is really asking the question, how can I maximize pleasure and minimize pain in the long run? And so what this means is that, yeah, I, I could go on a binge drinking spree and that's gonna make me feel really good in the moment. However, it's gonna lead to a lot of pain tomorrow and maybe even more further down the line based off the consequences of the things that happened during that binge drinking session. And so in that sense, in the long run, the, the calculus doesn't add up here. That would end up producing more pain than it does pleasure. And so what Epicurus stresses is moderation. Don't give yourself over to excess. Don't give yourself over to addictions. Don't give yourself over to things that are going to bring you more pain than pleasure in the long run. And so he very much stresses moderation. Um, and also he stresses the importance of a simple life. Because the more that you're pursuing wealth, the more attached you are to material things that can be taken away from you, the more anxiety you're going to have, the more stress you're going to have. And anxiety and stress are a kind of pain. And so for that reason, he stresses the importance of a simple life, a, a life where you have the things that you absolutely need, but not much else. And so, because as you start acquiring much else, that then starts to produce anxiety, starts to produce pain. And so he very much is trying to maximize pleasure, minimize pain, maintain a simple life. Next, we have Stoicism. Um, we find Stoicism in ancient Greece and is also very prevalent in ancient Rome. In fact, the reading that you're going to do comes from the Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius. Stoicism has some things in common with Aristotle, some things in common with Epicurus, but it also goes in a, its own direction as well. Now, maybe you've heard the term Stoicism. Maybe you've heard somebody described as Stoic. And so you might already have at least some kind of aesthetic level understanding of what this word means. Uh, but basically, the Stoics taught that we should be led by reason. And so again, we're getting the emphasis on reason rather than emotion, rather than the passions. And also the Stoics maintained a high belief in the idea of fate, the idea that there's a lot that happens that is maybe even everything that happens, right? That is simply outside of our control. And I, I think that this is very true. I think there's a lot of wisdom in recognizing this. It doesn't matter how healthy you are. It doesn't matter uh, how great of a diet you have, how much exercise you do, how much you take care of your body. You can still get cancer. You can still get hit by a car. Um, it doesn't matter how careful you are with your finances. Something can happen that's still going to take it all away. It doesn't matter how great you are with your relationships, right? Something can still happen out of your control that causes a breach in that relationship. And maybe it's not even like a relational breach, right? Maybe just a loved one dies. Um, and so something can happen that's going to fundamentally alter the things that you are investing in. And that's just the life that we live in, that so many things are simply outside of our control. And so what the Stoics are going to tell us is that the more that you are attaching yourself to the particulars of changing fortunes, well, or you're setting yourself up for failure. And the more that you are uh, failing to recognize that you are actually never attached to these things. They were never your own. No external good can ever truly be your own. It started without you and it can leave without you. 
And so what the Stoics are going to say is that um, you don't necessarily have to embrace poverty, right? You don't have to embrace the simple life of Epicurus, right? Remember, Marcus Aurelius was emperor of Rome. It's hard to get much more extravagant than that. However, what Marcus Aurelius would tell us is that we have an obligation to hold fortune in an open hand. So if it comes your way, that's fine. But if it leaves you, well, that's fine as well. We allow fortune to come into our hands, but we keep that hand open, recognizing that it can leave at any time. The wheel of fortune is constantly moving, and we don't have control over that. But what we do have control over, where we do have freedom, is in how we relate to that changing wheel of fortune. Real freedom for the Stoics, as well as for a lot of these ancient philosophers, real freedom is not found in the ability to do whatever we want. It's not found in the ability to achieve this or that particular external goal. Real freedom is in our ability to relate ourselves to our current circumstance, and that can never be taken away from you. It doesn't matter if you're emperor of Rome. It doesn't matter if you are falsely imprisoned awaiting your execution, uh, as we're going to see with one of our philosophers in the medieval era. It doesn't matter what your changing circumstance is, whether it is for good or whether it is for ill. You always have the freedom to decide how you're relating to your circumstances around you. And that is another insight we get from these ancients that I see as wisdom that I think that we can take and relate to our life immediately in all kinds of scenarios. In fact, in every scenario, and that's precisely the point. Freedom is internal. Freedom comes through our decision to relate ourselves positively to the world around us, regardless of what the world might look like around us at any given time. And I think that's where I will leave you for now. I hope that you enjoy these readings. Um, I find them very enriching. Even if you don't devote yourself wholly to Aristotelianism or to Stoicism, I hope that you're able to find some things that you can take from these readings and apply to your own life, building up your philosophy, making it stronger, getting a stronger sense of what is true, of what is good, and what is beautiful. And I look forward to speaking with you again in our live conversation in week three. If you have any questions before then, please don't hesitate to reach out. But until then, Godspeed.